How's everybody doing? Y'all doing good? I've got a new app on my phone I'm so excited about, which allows me to advance the slides myself. Only randomly help. Uh, first, isn't that funny? It worked perfectly at a small leadership meeting last Sunday night. And then, um, and then randomly my phone wouldn't, things happened. To which, can I just say it's not just me, the amazingly uh, wise in all technology, Joe Brownback took a while and said, it's not you, this is weird. So I just am feeling vindicated, or not. I'll just start talking because I know you're going to get it. I said that, oh, yay! <laughs> uh, oh, well, well, we got it. We, that's just to get you excited. There we go. Hey, give, give, the, <clears throat> give technology a hand. No, give the humans a hand that deal with technology. Okay, and um, I think there's maybe funky stuff going on with the microphone. But guess what? We're here together. That's all that matters. All right, we've been talking about build up. Have you been here? Uh, have you heard that? And um, we've been enjoying the fact that we have this amazing metaphor for building up right outside our door. Anybody driven 199 and, and noticed there's change going on? Has anybody memorized what lane to get into for your more happy traverse from Azel to Lake Worth? Yeah? So uh, we're, talking, we're talking about build up. We're talking about the stages of build up. And today's is called Earthworks. And these were the stages that Paul presented in, Paul became an expert on highway construction just to preach to you. And um, so the stages were planning and design, which he already covered. And today we're going to talk about earthworks. And then comes pavement and open. And how many of you will be happy when that highway out there is paved and open? Yep, yep. So earthworks, here's a little definition, are civil engineering works created by moving or processing, wait for it, quantities of soil. See, that's why they call it earthworks. Well, guess what? There's something else that was an earthwork, and that is the fact that when we were made, when God made Adam, Genesis 2-7 says, then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and be man became a living being. This was God's original earthwork. Yeah. You are his being breathed into something formed from the same elements that make up the earth. God's master of the earth. So I want to start by saying dust is not evil. There's nothing bad about humanity. God smiled on it. He looked at man and said, behold, it is very good. So there's nothing, God's not against humanity. He's not against you. He made you like you heard in that LTS testimony. He likes you. He loves you, but he also likes you. And Psalm 103, 14 says, For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we're dust. So when you have human frailties and failings and emotions or frailties sometimes, God's not in heaven going, wish you'd do better. He remembers because he knows better than you the chemistry that went into your formation, even your unique formation. And you know so many times the things that bug you and get all over you are a clue to your giftedness you just haven't seen them that way. It used to bug me so much. Poor customer service bugs me because I love to host people. I love when people walk in the door for them to be greeted and told where things are and me made to feel welcome. But that means the flip side of that is certain things annoy me that other people don't care about. So God knows you just have to hear from him what you were made for. If you don't know the purpose of a thing, you abuse it. But once you know the purpose of your gifting, you can get it turned to the positive and not to the negative. He likes you. Dust is not evil. It's just meant to be animated by the living God. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. Remember that band called Jars of Clay? It's a great band name. To show us that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Dust is not evil, it's just meant to be full of him. Letting him flow through the way he made you. So while the Greek view of man is tripart, you've heard this, 
spirit, soul, and body, tripart. The Hebrew view of man is simply inner man and outer man. So the Hebrews look at it more simply. There's the dust and there's the living God inside. So that's kind of simpler. Both views have merit. 2 Corinthians 4.16 shows the Hebrew view. We do not lose heart, though our outer self, our dirt, our earth, is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. So that's how that works. Flesh is simply the unrenewed earth. But here's the secret. When that resurrection life is in your inner man, it can even inform your earth how to be better. It can resurrect your outer man. That's what the Bible says. So the outer man's wasting away. In other words, it's in touch with decay and entropy out here. But the inner man pulling from heaven, that's even changing the outer man. God can do earthworks. You are earth. You have some earth. But the good news today is he can handle it. He can handle it. The stuff in you is more than enough to take care of the stuff outside you connecting to the earth. Flesh that the Bible talks about is simply the pulls of earth on you, on the unrenewed parts of you. So we do have to be real, though, and say sometimes earth can get in the way of seeing and cooperating with God's purposes. Sometimes your flesh can get in the way. Galatians 5.17 says the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. So there is a pull. It's not a pull that's unconquerable. It's in fact already conquered, but there is a pull. So in us, there is earth to be moved. Now this picture here is some highway somewhere. I asked Paul to get me a picture of this out here, but life is busy. And um, that didn't manifest. So I just went online and found a picture similar to the dirt out here. Will you go with me that that looks like the dirt out here? <laughs> Funny thing has happened. So this church is my reference point. My life is here. My office is here. My husband is here. My kids are often here. There's stuff going on here. You're my family. I love you. I love you. So can you understand that every day when I drive to the gym in Lake Worth, my eyes always look over to this property to see what's going on. Like, I know people's cars, and I think, oh, so-and-so's there. Oh, who stopped in? Is Darlene there? Darlene doesn't always bring her car, so I don't ever know for sure with Darlene. But, but you know, it's like a reference point. Well, guess what? The highway department and the progress out there has messed with my reference point. When I pass now and I look left, I, instinctively, I'm, I get right about here, I look left. Has Paul left yet to meet me for lunch? Thank you. Thank you for that laugh, my son. <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> I look left and I go, what's going on at the Abbey? Has Paul left yet? Is, what's, what's life like? There now is a mound of dirt. I can't see. I can't monitor. My bearings are off. And I thought yesterday when I was thinking about this message, I passed that one more time and I thought, man, that's like the kingdom. It's like you, you want kingdom things as a reference point, and God's shown you some things, and you know they're there, but there just comes this mound of flesh and humanity that is obscuring your view. And when your view is obscured, you need to get it cleared. You need to get it cleared. Now, this particular pile of dirt, I found this hilarious. I don't know where this is. doesn't matter. Somewhere in America where I-94 is. Anybody know I-94? I have no idea. Up north. Thank you. Okay, I figured it was... Somewhere, not near here, because I hadn't heard of it. This, uh, someone wrote into a message board, and they said this. The huge dirt pile near I-94 has been there for a while, and now there's grass growing on it, they said. And then this person asked the highway department, is that hill going to be permanent there? And I thought, isn't that like our lives? Sometimes there's a mound of humanity, something about you, something about the past, something that's standing in your way and obscuring your view of Jesus or the kingdom or your destiny. And grass starts growing on it because it has sat there so long. And you start asking the question, excuse me, Lord, <clears throat> would, would this be permanent? <laughs> has anyone ever got to that place? In the early days, you go, yeah, my destiny. I'm going to take over the world for Jesus. I'm going to be the most awesome fill-in-the-blank there ever was for him. And then some stuff in your human nature or relationships or finances. I don't know where your earth is, but whatever that mound is, sits there. So at first, you speak to the mountain and tell it to go, and you're all like, yeah, that's got to go. But things wear on, 
and it doesn't leave and grass grows. And there comes a place in your psyche where you think, I wonder if this is permanent. And I want to declare to you today, the Holy Spirit is able to move it. He's able to reclaim your view of the kingdom, not just out there, but for you. For you, the kingdom of God for you. You don't have to go be a missionary or a major evangelist. It's about you being the best you you can be. That's the kingdom. The best you that he created you to be, that's the kingdom. So if your view is obscured right now, I want to tell you there is hope. Here's a couple of scriptures that talk about that hope. Jeremiah 1.10, this is just convincing us that God is a master of earthwork. Jeremiah 1.10, the work of the messenger of God is this. He says, see, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and break down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Do you realize there's twice as much destruction, earthwork, as there is build and plant? Just an interesting thought there. God can handle it. God can handle you and me. Isaiah 40 verse 4 is the preparation for a savior. Every valley will be raised up. Every mountain and hill will be lowered. Steep places will be made level. Rough places made smooth. Your humanity is not evil, but sometimes it obscures your view of the kingdom. And if that's the case, you're a candidate for earthwork. Good news, the Holy Spirit specializes it. There's a thing called an earth mover, and evidently there are colossal ones, evidently. And an earth mover is a machine such as a bulldozer for excavating, pushing, or transporting large quantities of earth, as in road building. And I found it interesting that the first known use of that word earth mover was 1879. So I'm guessing that was a steam-powered one, right? I don't know. But ever since there's been progress, there's been man going, how are we going to move vast quantities of earth? So today, will you go there with me deeper for this being a metaphor for God's work in you? Because I don't know about you, I love it being transformed. Everybody says change is hard and everybody doesn't like change. But when you remember that the changing is a transformation into what you were created to be, it makes it so desirable. I like change. I like change. I may not like the discomfort in the moment, of letting go of an old way. But if you really get a vision that you are being gloriously transformed, that's the purpose of the glory of God is to transform you. So there are these earth movers. So if they're existent in the natural, I bet you God can pull off something even more amazing in the spirit. And sometimes you have to move a lot of dirt, don't you? Sometimes there's a whole army of earth movers. And you know, all of us, need some dirt moved. Again, God smiles on your humanity. He likes you. The deal is, however, if it is blocking something in your destiny, it's time to take action. It's time to move along. It's time for change. Amen? Okay, it's worth it. Is your dirt keeping you from your destiny? The Holy Spirit is the great accomplisher of earth work. Now, let's get a little, obviously, that girl is happy and free, right? Because there's nothing hindering. And in your heart, you need to know, even if you have problems currently, even if there are hindrances currently, you and your destiny have a clear path between them. The road to your destiny, the road to the thing God purposed for you, and he has one for every individual in this place and everywhere, that road is clear in him. So whatever's standing in the way, we want some earthwork. So we need to get specific, because you're probably mostly, are you, are you mostly on board right now? Mostly? You mostly want the earthwork? You're okay with that, right? It's for progress. Okay. So specifically, what earthwork, what actually needs work? What is the actual earth? Well, I sold you the end product, glorious transformation, so that this part would go down easier. And you have Macaulay Culkin going, oh no, right? The famous Home Alone uh, face. Because that's me trying to remove your pain in the fact that mostly what we're going to have to have moved by these bulldozers of the Holy Ghost are our judgments and our personal opinions. 
Again, God wants you to be you, and it's totally fine that you have personal opinions. Like, you'd be boring. It Wouldn't it be boring if we were all the same? Wouldn't it be boring if we all agreed? I mean, we're all being conformed to the image of Christ, but that image of Christ is vastly diverse. You being in the image of Christ can adore jazz, while somebody else being in the image of Christ can only like classical. I mean, these opinions and preferences are part of what's wired into us and part of the glorious diversity of our Father. However, when they impede our progress, let's take that music preference thing. If God wants you to open up and be a minister to all forms of musicians and you keep dissing one form, that personal opinion just hindered that. Am I right? Here, let's bring this home even more closely. Have you ever, who, you don't need to raise your hands, although my hand goes up, I'm just wanting to volunteer myself as this. Before you have kids and you're in the grocery store and you are in the checkout and somebody's kid is screaming, anybody, a few people are nodding. Before you have kids, it's real easy to have an opinion about what you would do if that were your kid. Am I talking to anybody? Am I talking to anybody? And then that first time you're the one in the grocery store and it's your kid screaming, there is a lot of earthwork going on inside you. At least if you're me, because I just sit there remembering how many times I thought, bless that mother's heart. I wish they knew what I know that you need to discipline your kids. And then you are tasked with that job and you're going, I repent on every level. I repent. Um, I work out. And there was a time in my life that keeping myself trim was a little easier than it is now. And I didn't realize I had judgments about people who didn't work out <laughs> until I looked the way I currently look, which I know is different. In other words, all I'm saying is opinions are opinions. They're not harmful until the Holy Spirit gets on that and you realize I am judging. Because here's the deal. We're going to get into it deeper in a minute. There's only one system of judgment, and if you're doing it there, it's coming right back on you. I had a subtle judgment of, well, I'm not better than people that don't work out, but subtly I thought, oh, never. (laughs) And now I am (laughs) middle-aged. You can laugh with me about this. It's funny. It's very funny. And so I'm walking into 24 Hours Fitness going, yeah, I feel... That's my judgment. You understand, I'm not walking into anybody else's judgment. I mean, I'm walking to one I've tolerated for a few years, and now it's on me. Why? Because when you judge that way, the way the thing works is it comes right back on you. It's, it's, it just is. But that's still good news, y'all. This is going to be good news. You're, you're going to, do you need to do this for a minute? Do you need to go, oh, no. If that helps, do it. Anybody? No? You're all right? Okay. All right. You seem good. So Jesus said, judge not so that you won't be judged. For in the same way, here's what I just said, in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. He doesn't mean by you necessarily, I mean by him necessarily. He means you just picked it, so that's what you're dancing with. You will dance with the one that brung you. So in the same way you judge that mom with a crying baby, you just pick that system for yourself down the road. Hallelujah. Isn't that great? Uh, And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Again, he's not saying from heaven. I don't see that. I see a sowing and reaping right here on earth. We could say, don't enter into a system of judgment because the system you choose is the one you'll live by. And even he can't stop you from that if you choose it. He don't want you to judge because he don't want you to be judged because he doesn't look at people in that kind of judgment. All the judgment went on Jesus at the cross. But if you choose it, you are temporarily dancing with it until you choose to do differently. You get to do differently. That's earth work. So the power of perception is that the view we incubate determines our participation and therefore feeds back into our identity. I can't go as deep on this slide, but there'll be other messages that that I can go deeper on. But just believe me, it's a feedback loop. How I see myself feeds into how I behave which feeds into how people treat me and back into my identity. You see that it's a system of judgment that God, he ordained me to choose how I think. So he tries to interrupt that, but when I'm in it, I'm in it. So do you see that this might be the root of some issues in our lives? Um, This is the truth of the children of Israel. If you remember in the book of Numbers, I think it's 13 verse 33. They 
the spies that were sent into the promised land said of the giants that were in the land, they said, we were like grasshoppers in their sight and uh, in our sight, and so were we in their sight. So what they said is, we were in a system where we looked like losers and they looked like powerful and we couldn't break out of that system. And that's what happens. If how you view yourself is what you feed out, even unconsciously, and other people will feed it back to you. Then you go, I have evidence. I, I have evidence I'm a loser. No, you don't. You have a system you chose to participate in, and you worked the system and generated results that corroborated your belief. Right. Yeah. Right. That's how powerful you are. But you can change. So let's go a little deeper into that. Isn't this fun? It's going to get more fun. Let's say, we're going to do a little exercise. Let's say that this, this gloriously but pixelated view, pretend it's not very pixelated, pretend this is HD. Let's say that this is the spiritual landscape promised to you. So I don't know how many of you have ever gotten, like maybe in worship you get lost in the presence of God and you just have that moment where you go, it really is all good. Anybody had that moment? You go, yeah, God has a destiny for me. He likes me. Whatever's wrong with me, he's able to handle it. Clear landscape, right? But life happens and something, a thought gets introduced into our minds. Well, there is that promise in the scripture. There is the good God. But in fact, there's this about me. Now, sometimes you are innocently handed this judgment from somebody else who's in the system. Yeah? Somebody who's living in a system of judging you and the worst are Christian systems, will hand you a criticism and say, well, yeah, but you don't pray enough. You don't know the Bible. You whatever. I'm, I'm hitting and missing because you each have your own. Maybe it's not even about Christianity. Maybe it's like somebody when you were little said, well, you just don't have that gift. Well, if you buy it and meditate on it, if you choose it, what does that just do to that view of that landscape, right? And then what happens is when you get in the system, more things pile up, don't they? Because if you believe, if you start believing, well, God's promise is true, but the list gets longer, doesn't it? And in a little while, when you've accepted a few judgments, you've entered into the system of judgment, if I show you that, you're not anymore looking at the clouds and the grass, are you? You're looking at the judgments that have piled up right in front of your face. Notice they're closer to your face than the destiny that God's showing you down the road. Jesus talked about that speck in your eye and the beam in somebody else's, the speck in somebody else's, rather, and the beam in your eye. I fully believe he's talking about judgment. You know, a speck is a beam in the distance. A beam is that judgment right up in front of your face. But the good news is, here's, here it is again, I chose those judgments. I chose that system. I chose it, that means I can unchoose it. They're not permanent. That mound of dirt growing grass is not permanent. The power to choose what I think about, what I accept as true, cannot be taken from me. So I chose to judge and I didn't know when I judged that person, it came straight back on me. There's only one judgment. It's two-edged. But I can unchoose it. That's good news. It's my choice. It's not God's choice. It's not the devil's choice. It's my choice. Now, judgments, I think this is funny. Judgments are like predictive texting. When predictive texting came out, I was doing youth at the time. Um, Joe and many of our younger group was in the youth group. And I was fascinated with predictive texting. And I had this thing I would do. I would be texting my kids and it would spell it wrong and say some outlandish thing like we're having um, bourbon for dinner. You know, something I didn't text. You, you get me. Like I'd be saying we're having chicken and it would come out as giraffe or something. And I would just send it because I thought they were entertaining. And, <laughs> and so <laughs> I just thought no one cared what we we're having for dinner anyway, so I might as well make them laugh and make them wonder. I like to keep my kids guessing, so I just sent all these weird texts. But I have, uh, I have heard of some that were more dire than that, right? Uh, the judgments we make are like predictive texting. They often guess wrong without knowing the whole story. So this joke says, the man who invented predictive text died yesterday, his fun fair is next monkey. 
Do you get it? Okay, anybody use, use autocorrect, right, right? Well, look, y'all, I tried hard to find funny examples, and most of them are dirty. I couldn't bring them. If you've ever, <laughs> most of them were filthy, so that's the best I could do. <laughs> you would not believe how much I tried. The <laughs> what is predictive texting doing? It's guessing. It's guessing what you're trying to say before you say it. And in my case, I don't say things normally, so it's never right. I'm always saying something more unique than predictive texting guessed. But you guys, our brains are amazing data collectors, and we're always predictive texting. So in the case of like rejection, somebody walks in, maybe you come to church, and somebody's unfriendly to you or looks at you funny or frowns at you. And what does your predictive texting do? It goes, they don't like me. That's probably wrong. It's probably that they may be going through hell, and you don't know it. But your predictive texting doesn't know Perry Ann. So the guesses it makes at what I'm texting are so funny and so wrong. But it's not funny when it's issues of life. And we try to process, this happened, so that means this about me. We're predictive texting, we're, we're auto-correcting, and we don't have all the data about us. Have you ever had something, you know, I remember, I just suddenly remembered this. We went to the 9-11 memorial in New York City. It's the most intense place I've ever visited in my whole life. The guy... The tour guide, the little volunteer tour guide at the front, he said, he gave us our little orientation, and he said, we just want you to know there's eggs in every room, there are exits on the four corners if it gets too intense. They said, we've made every room where you can run out of the room if you can't take it. And naively, at the moment, I thought, isn't that a little much? I mean, you know, I'm sure, I lived through 9-11, I'm sure I can take it. About three quarters of the way into it, I was going, where's that exit? <laughs> like, I'm telling you, it was, it was super intense. But you know, what I remember too, is that there were so many stories of people who for some reason didn't make it to work that day. Now in that moment, I remember lots of stories like that, where something went so bad wrong, and they thought it was the end of the world, and they were like, not showing up for their job. Can you imagine the error of predictive texting at that moment in your mind when, in fact, it saved your life? See, we don't think like God thinks. So when we jump ahead and try to guess what he's doing, sometimes we get it so wrong and erode our own trust factor with him when, in fact, he's at work. He's at work. He's always at work. Well, what if I haven't been trusting him and perfect and he's still at work? The only way he stops working, he doesn't. But the only way is if you say don't. If you, and then even then, if you're just saying it out of hurt, I think he sees past that and he still woos and works because he looks at the heart. So we don't have to have predictive texting in our life. Proverbs 3, 5 says, lean not to your own understanding. I like to say I'm not leaning to my own predictive texting about this situation. Why didn't this work out the way? Well, maybe it's this, this. Lean not to that understanding. Zoom out and look at the big picture. Okay, and just a little specialty case here. Uh, just to say religion is based on judgment. So what's bad is when the judgments that are personally and random get organized into a grid of legalism. Religious legalism obscures your clear view of destiny. So if it's about qualifying, listen, there are do's and don'ts in Christianity. There are. There are do's and don'ts but they don't affect your value. You're just as valuable. Your destiny's not earned by doing the do's and doning the don'ts. Your destiny is God's son or daughter purpose for you. The do's and don'ts are about you staying alive to get there. They're not about his love for you or his value of you. The don'ts are literally to keep you alive and sane while you get there. Many have violated those don'ts and arrived somewhere, but maybe not sane. And I just threw in some more slides because I got a little carried away with this, that religion can come in all shapes and sizes. So religion can be hard, fast, or it can be lots and lots. You know, the Talmud in the Old Testament was rules added to the law. Lots and lots of rules and regulations. And if something's obscuring your view, deal with it because you chose that system, you can unchoose it. And then this one's my favorite. Can you see that little warp in the middle? 
I just love that because here's what I've noticed about religion. I'm a student of culture. I'm a student of spiritual culture. I've been doing this research 30 years. What I've noticed about the people that have this perfecty, perfecty grid is they ain't as perfect as they claim to be. <laughs> you know what I mean? When you get around them, they got wavy lines in the middle like the rest of humanity. They just keep talking about the grid. So I believe we can live free of judgment and we don't need religion to help us. Judgment, in this case, a grid of do's and don'ts, religion can be let go of and you can get back into reality just like you can personally. So, but in the little bit of time we have left, are you enjoying this? You feel your faith to let go of personal opinions? Yeah. I always laugh because when people go, is this okay? I always think, I don't know why preachers ask that because they're going to do it anyway, including me. I'm going to do it anyway. But it is great when, it's, when we're having fun together. So this is just a little Greek word study that will wind it down with this. Okay, go with me here into words. The Bible word for God's glory and you do know that God's glory is meant to be revealed in us. Romans 8.18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that's about to be revealed in us. In us. Through us, but in us too. So glory is what he has for you. It's you being you and shining. Glory is just shining for him. The Bible word for that is doxa. You probably, lots of you heard that before. That's the Greek word. The root word of doxa is this word. Dokeo, which means to appear or seem to be, or it means a personal opinion or subjective judgment. So one meaning of this root word of glory is actually opinion. Glory is God's opinion. Isn't that interesting? So for the classic rockers in the building, no matter what age you are, Pete Townsend would have been right if he'd written the song from the rock opera Tommy to the right Messiah. Because he, what he wrote is, from you I get opinions, on you I see the glory. That's true of Jesus, isn't it? Yeah. What about getting your opinions from his glory? Yeah. That's a good place to get your opinions. Okay, you go with me there. Then here's what's interesting. Dokeo, which is that root word that can mean opinion, is also the root word for another word that means a judgment. It means a decree or a negative judgment. And we see that word in Colossians 2.14 where it declares the handwriting of judgments that are against us was nailed to the cross and done away with. So dokeo, this word for opinion, is also the root when it's saying all the bad opinions attached to you were done away with. The blood of Jesus ran all over it. They were nailed to the cross. Isn't that amazing? So that Greek word, not surprisingly, is the word dogma. And dogma is a word we widely use to represent legalism. The dogma that was chaining you up. You know, somebody might come and say, here are all the commandments you've broken. They'd read the dogma of judgments against you. And you know what Jesus' response is? That's exactly why I died. To free that person right. from the guilt in that case. So here's a little diagram to make it simple. Dokeo, we think of it as our ability to perceive and judge, our ability to predictive text, if you will. It can either be dogma, a limiting judgment, or it can be doxa, a glorious God opinion. Your ability to perceive, to have an identity, to judge others, to look at others, can either be a dogma, well, they didn't perform, that baby's crying, or it can be a doxa. Oh, I'd love to go over and hug that mother right now because I've been there when that baby's crying in the checkout. Yeah. Right? That's doxa. Doxa smiles on us. Doxa lifts us higher. Doxa shows us where we were meant to shine. While dogma is what he died to free us from. Limiting judgments of who we are. Guys, we have evidence. Are you human? If we're honest, we all have evidence for what's wrong with us. We all do, but Jesus is never letting that limit who we are destined to become. Never. Okay, so obviously what we want is this, don't we? We want to move from our personal dogma, our limiting judgments, to doxa, to glorious as God opinion of who he is, who we are in his image, and who each other is. 
Everything changes when you see people the glorious way he intended for them to be. And so that is where we need this, right? That's where the earth is. The earth is in our opinions and our personal judgments. And the Holy Spirit wants to work to change us, to let us let those shift into into glory. So the take home of this message is simply let the Holy Spirit help you rescue your perceptive abilities from negative judgments. It's not just you. It's your that inner imagination, that inner identity spot in you, that seed of existence really in you has been captured by negative judgments about yourself, about others, and even about God. It may take some real earth work. What, do, what does that involve? Time? Is this taking time out here? I mean, anybody think the highway is taking time? Thank you. <laughs> I do too. It may take some inconvenience. Yeah. If you have to leave a little earlier to get to Lake Worth these days than you do before they started this. But won't the highway created be worth it? Yeah. You guys, this is where so many Christians bog down. They, they get started, but somewhere between the start and the completion of a process of God, they get discouraged. And I want to give you hope today that there are real things you can do to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to finish your course and actually have that day come when you can drive on that highway. Remember, highways are for the rapid transport of people and goods. They're to make life easier in the end. In, in our case, in the spiritual world, and the way we're talking about build up, it's not just a highway to heaven. No, 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 no. It's a highway for heaven. Because yeah. heaven has some things to send to us now in this life. Yeah. John 10:10. 10, 10, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. God's so, got so much abundant life to give you, it takes a highway to get it here. Yeah. But if that road's not cleared and, that, and not paved and not open, then he's just sending it in trickles, and he wants to send the full mother load to you. God, it's not just a highway to heaven. That's trying to beg and plead and clean people up to get them to heaven. That is religion. This is a highway for heaven, realizing he did the work to make heaven available to you in this life so that you can love people, not hurt all the time, not feel rejection, not feel self-loathing, not feel depressed, not feel so many of those things that come from humanity gone awry. Humanity is not evil, but if it's standing in the way of John 10, 10, abundant life, it can be moved. God's got an army of bulldozers. My daddy was in the, he was a Navy CB, and in World War II, he was stationed in the Aleutian Islands, and they literally reworked uh, the ice flows in the Aleutian Islands of Alaska. I don't know how you, I mean, he drove heavy equipment like those yellow things. In fact, he, one of my favorite stories, I would always make him tell me this story again and again. He was driving a, you call them caterpillars, is that right, Don? Earth mover, okay. He was driving an earth mover that belonged to the Navy and in the Aleutians, and they were, I don't know what they were doing, they were building, that's what CBs did, they were building things so we could win the war, and he hit a patch of ice, and he was sliding, and he tried, and he knew, I guess when an earth mover is sliding, it's the same as a car on ice, if you can't stop it, you can't stop it, and so my daddy said he knew he would either die going into the Bering Sea with it, or, or bail, so he, he bailed, he got out because he couldn't stop it. And so to this day, there's an earth mover uh, in, in the Bering Sea that Floyd Clark, my daddy, put there. <laughs> I feel proud of that for some reason. <laughs> and I don't know why. He never told me about this, but I always tried to imagine it. When he came in to his commanding officer, and they said, okay, Clark, where's the, did you, did you put your, did you park your earth mover? <laughs> he went, well, funny story about that. <laughs> He never told me that part, but I just imagine what, what did the U.S. Navy write on the report, you know? <laughs> uh, machinist mate slid and bailed. I don't, <laughs> anyway, I'm so glad he bailed. I wouldn't be here today. Hey, I wouldn't be here today. I don't think you lived through the bottom of the Bering Sea. The, <laughs> but you know what? That honestly hit me as a picture just now of the fact that 
even if you're icy, God can still build things and move things. They, uh, they did a lot of work up there uh, that, that helped with the war effort. And uh, the conditions, he, he, he had a joke he used to say, uh, yeah, Fran, when I was stationed in the Aleutian Islands, he said, it was so cold, we'd say something to each other, and we'd have to take our words inside and thaw them out to see what we said. <laughs> <laughs> he was like that. <laughs> he, he said things a lot that we'd, <laughs> wow, wow, Daddy, where'd you get that? I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, even if it's, even, you may be sitting here today, and you may think, you know, I believed all this once, but I think I've grown icy. I've just been through a lot. Can I tell you, first of all, I understand. Life can dish out a lot. But more important than me and Paul understanding is God understands. And if you feel like you're icy and cold and you have to even take your words inside to thaw them out and see what they said, still God can move your earth. God can move ice. God can, I'm wanting to break into a song from Frozen right now. But God can move, let it go, let it go, let it go. I'm now going to be hearing that all day and I apologize to those of you to whom I've just suggested that. You can, <laughs> God will help you. Even if you've grown icy, he specializes. I guarantee you, he wouldn't call you into this life and then fail to help you move the stuff that's hindering. It's not up to you. It's not up to you to perform. Don't do this thing. The Galatians backsliding was they got back into works. Right. Having been filled with the spirit, they got back into works. And, and Paul had to write to him and say, hey, do you receive the Spirit by the works of the flesh or by faith? Because the whole thing's by faith. Yeah. And yeah. letting him help you let go of some judgments and opinions. Can I tell you, when you, I have gotten so used to being wrong. Oh, I'll, be on, I'll tell you an honest story. This week, through a series of events, I had to go hear a man speak from a denomination that I had thought was religious. Any of you free Christians, free charismatics ever judged any other denomination as being religious? Thank you for your honesty. I haven't walked around foaming at the mouth about it. It was just a little quiet opinion I had. I didn't walk into the, to the place where the man was speaking and think, what's this going to be? I, didn't, I wasn't overt. But as the man spoke, doggone it, that man didn't have a heart for Jesus in him. And I heard his heart. And I sat on the front row and I turned to my friend who was there next to me and I said, wow, this was great. I said, yet again, I've dropped a judgment. And then I said, I heard myself say to her, I said, this is becoming so regular, I almost don't even repent anymore. I just let go. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because you, you, just, you just get so, I love it that I'm getting used to being wrong when I judge. I'm loving it that I'm used enough to being shown that person is wonderful. You just had a little judgment. I mean, granted, if you have a big, huge one, you probably need to repent. But it's, it's muscle memory. I'm getting quicker at it. It's great. I love it. I don't have to go cry and pray through and, uh, you know, I just go, I was wrong. God, you're, thank you. Thank you for that person. That's awesome. I, I, I don't want to live by my own judgments. All right, so I'm going to close with something funny here. I think you, I think you clearly get the point. I'm going to close with something funny. This is actually a bumper sticker I saw once. This is a button. So not to confuse you, that is not a bumper sticker, but I couldn't find a slide of the bumper sticker. I, I saw it as a bumper sticker at Brookshire's in Azel, which I don't think of as the new age capital of the world. And yet, uh, and yet, this was on somebody's bumper sticker. It said, my karma just ran over your dogma. Do you get it? Car, dog. I didn't get it at first. Car, dog. My karma ran over your... See, that's funny. So that's some new ager that is like going, hey, you're so legalistic. I'm all free and flowy. My karma just ran over your dogma. Ha, 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 ha. And, and I laughed. I giggled. And... Um, and then I went on my way. But then I started studying this and the fact that dogma, we really do need something to run over our dogma sometimes, right? But it ain't karma, it's doxa. Our doxa just demolished our dogma. And that's what I wanna advertise strongly to you this morning is there's a glory, our glory. The opinions of God will move that earth. 
that is standing between you and destiny. The opinions of God are the doxa glory that will crush dogma, those judgments, those lines that you draw across people. Be careful. You've been burned. Watch it. All those things. Listen, if you just try to lay down judgments in your own strength, I actually think that's probably good. But you don't even have to do it in your own strength. You can get so radically impacted by an encounter with who God really is. That's why we push LTS. It's not about more dogma and lines and grids. It's about an encounter with who, how much God loves you. He's like doxying all over you. He's like wanting to spill out good opinions. Like Alyssa said, that sloppy wet kiss. He wants to hug you in ways you've never been hugged on the inside before. And then you will watch one by one as you get to choose to let go judgments you've made. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, I'm glad we're together today, and I'm glad we're experiencing this, and I'm glad we're up for the earth work. Um, if we can just, Daniel had to leave. Uh, do you want to strum guitar? Or Okay, we're just going to have Joe come. Daniel had to go to a wedding. So are you, you're going to play, uh, I thought you were going to play keys. I was like, Joe, do you play keys? didn't know that at my house <laughs> never heard that before yeah I, I just want to pray uh as we close here uh I'm just going to pray over you and if you uh, just really wherever it's a heart thing you don't have to stand up but just where you're seated if you want to ask God to grace you to lay down a judgment or two or a system of judgment if you really feel like you've been in a system of judgment, then at the end, uh, we'll have glory team members, people that just will pray with you down here. If you really want help beyond this prayer, because if you've been in a system of it, you can get caught in that. And sometimes it takes an input of somebody else's doxa faith to get out of that system. But more than that, I just think today, it's really just about telling the Lord we are open to laying down some judgments. And really, once you tune in, it's he'll speak to you. He'll walk with you. He'll work with you. Beware, because the judgments you have about other people usually do have an edge back at yourself. Will always do. Sometimes they're limiting you more than others. So, Father, we just all come to you today, bringing our hearts. We just come to you. We... First of all, repent of judging you. If there's any area in our life where we have started to wonder if you actually want good for us, Lord, we recognize right now we don't want to think that, and we choose to let go of that black bar hindering our view of you. And Father, if there are judgments we have about others and so much judgments about ourselves, Lord, we just want to lay those on the altar right now. We made those judgments so we can choose to get rid of those judgments. The power is ours. I feel like for some of you, I just had a picture in my spirit of those black bars having a word on them. So for some of you, just be sensitive if the Holy Spirit's showing you what that particular judgment looks like in you. It might not be what you think. You know, we only think we know ourselves. <laughs> the Holy Spirit really knows so just uh, we just pause for a minute in your presence and let you help us Lord and Lord I just declare almost like a, a whole spine chiropractic adjustment back to John 10 10 today it's the thief that comes to steal kill and destroy but it's you that comes that we might have life and have it in overflowing measure so Lord we receive your life. We receive your doxa. And we commit to the earth work. We thank you that your doxa completely destroys and demolishes our dogma. For those that have been on the journey of a while and feel weary and feel like there's grass growing on my dirt, Father, right now, would you encourage them? This too shall pass. There is an end in sight. This dirt is not my story. This dirt is not my view. I will get there.
There will be a glorious day. The roads open and highways of goods, transport from heaven will pass upon it. My situation of dirt is not permanent. Father, I pray that by your spirit, you would completely just seal this work in people's hearts. And, and even this week, I, I pray that you would work with them and need them, need this like bread, like, like yeast and bread into their lives, that you would become so real to them that your love would just be unquestionable. And Father, we just receive that right now in the name of Jesus. And we thank you. Thank you for it. Sam Brownback's coming. Amen. Sounds good. Amen. Aren't y'all glad that God is the Father first and not just someone on the throne judging you? So we will make our glory team available, I think, at the front. I just want to encourage you, come get some prayer if you need anything. Just if there's perceptions in your mind that you need to, judgments that you need blocked out. We just want to pray with you for the week and just pray for some suddenlies. Um, just a couple of reminders before we leave. LTS, make sure and get registered. Uh, O2network.org slash events. Um, next week is Father's Day, so make sure and invite your fathers. Um, and then if you're a first-time guest with us, our vision team would like to give you a gift. Just shake your hand and meet you. So they're going to be in the dining room to my left and your right. Um, make sure and come by and say hi. With that, thank you for coming to the Abbey. You're blessed. Amen. you hear me